I'm a uh, 3L, a uh, third year student at UCLA Law. I hear welcome, but I think most of you guys are from UCLA or, or yeah. So it's just not, it's not exactly a welcome warranted, but welcome back. <laughs> and I think, so despite the number of audience members, the uh, conversation that we will have and the information we'll share will be very like, you know, provoking and uh, informational and I'm sure beautiful collaboration will come out this way. So, very high expectations. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess I get that impression because I, I was frantically checking out all the panelists and like Google the names and then try to get you know try to get some sense of what they have been up to other than official bios. So it's sort of like, you know, so the today's panels have the most ambitious goals like of covering like some of the topics that were mentioned of their particular work include globalization, criminal justice. And then race and racism, of course, and then like immigration. So it's like those are the topics sort of uh, crossing the, the net, you know, the confines of the, you know, the U.S. boundary, and just kind of moves on to globalization. Like honestly, I don't think I have seen any panel like who who have that or as a, as an academic or analytical goal. So with that, and let me introduce the first presenter to the today with the provoking images. <laughs> so um. Uh, let's see. Okay, Beth Yeah. Then I, you know, there are all these impressive bios that were shared from the conference <coughs> uh, uh, printout, so I will not really repeat that, but I have really uh, interesting code I found from the website. I will post up. So it's like, um, <laughs> yeah, Professor Campbell says, I enjoy helping law students develop the analytical skills necessary for practicing law and challenging them to think about legal issues from different perspectives. For one, I don't really think I hear different perspectives from the law school classroom. <laughs> like, you don't really talk, yeah, talk about that. And I encourage my students to follow their passions. Oh, yet another rare quote. <laughs> and to think creatively about how we use the law to pursue justice. So, yeah, I really like that part. And her life trajectory sort of all kind of follows through. She is truly believing in, like, you know, how, uh, how she is teaching students and that she's also practicing that as well. So, I think with that, I wanted to also move on to. She had a very interesting publication. Globalization and California's new approach to provide juvenile lifers a meaningful opportunity for release. And uh, deportation, okay, banished for life, deportation of juvenile off offenders as cruel and unusual punishment. And excluding criminals from immigration reform. And I'm sure that is also connected to what uh, Professor Cesaro will say later on. And then, uh, and of course, we go going to uh, lovely Ellen C. Caldwell. And I had, I couldn't really see the visual studies part that I was kind of dying to see the title that's Met, Mythopia, and Mapping. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether I'm pronouncing it correctly. Frohawk, mm -hmm. Frohawk to pet two feathers and the making of the Franklish Empire. I don't think no law like <laughs> scholarship would, would come up with that yeah, interesting like just title in itself. So she's from Pepperdine University and she teaches, uh, so she uses uh, memory studies and art historical approach. Her paper and then her entire <coughs> thing sort of uh, considers contemporary uh, artists and then a different type of uh, work to, uh, I think I kind of like the part. Critical ex exploration of uh, like time and space, fact and fiction, and then the here and now. That was really beautiful, and then I I was immediately hooked mm -hmm. to like what these both phenomenal like health wells will present today. <laughs> like we're yeah, I'm sad that her parents wouldn't be able to see that today, but I think they will be yeah, equally provoked and then please. Okay, so please let me present. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Uh, so yeah, so we're sisters. Um, <laughs> Alan's an art historian, I'm a, a lawyer, and we've been talking about how images sort of intersect with, with the law for a long time. We wrote one piece that focuses on criminalization, and now um, we're going to be focusing on, on the constructions of, of immigrants uh, using images to sort of uh, facilitate the conversation. 
So, you know, I think in this room, everybody knows, right, there's sort of been a mass deportation effort in the past several years where uh, estimates of around 2 million people having been deported under President Obama's administration. And many of these people are not just apprehended at the border, right, they're sort of uh, sought out in their homes, in their communities, and are then uh, deported, uh, sometimes permanently. Um, so we have disruptions of, of families going on, which are fairly reminiscent of a historical uh, Operation Wetback, right? The official name of this mass deportation effort in 1954 that resulted in the deportation of around a million people, mainly to Mexico. Uh, and it was so broad that it also swept up many U.S. citizens in, in the deportation effort. So there's just sort of uh, interesting parallel going on. The enforcement techniques used in Operation Wetback are pretty similar to what we're seeing with secure communities in Arizona's SB 1070 in terms of utilizing traffic stops and, and really looking for people who are just going about their day-to-day -day lives. Um, but So although the, the language used for current, the current deportation regime is fairly race neutral, uh, with some exceptions, right? Deportation, it really is still motivated by historic racialized constructions of immigrants, primarily Latino immigrants. Um, and, and I think really that the sort of central nexus between deportation and whiteness as property is this uh, idea of the right to exclude, right, which, which Professor Harris identifies as the common conceptual nucleus of whiteness and property. Certainly, deportation is sort of the mass exclusion, often permanently, of primarily people of color. Right? So it's not surprising that most of the people being deported are uh, Latino and, and, and black. Uh, there's also sort of a core group of people who are being deported to, to Cambodia, although they've spent most of their lives in the United States. But we have this inherent conflict, right, where the United States purports to be this nation that welcomes immigrants, giving me your huddled masses, yearning to be free. Um, but, but at the same time, we have this history of race-based exclusion, um, not only based on race, also based on other sort of um, uh, people who are marginalized due to poverty, disability status, but, but primarily based on national origin, which uh, then correlates to race. So Kevin Johnson at, at UC Davis sort of identifies this as the myth of inclusion. There's this rhetoric that we welcome immigrants, but at the same time, you know, darker-skinned immigrants are not really welcomed, and they are systematically sort of rounded up and, and can be deported. So what we want to focus on um, is to, to two sort of socially constructed myths uh, that we think help explain how this contradiction with the huddled masses myth uh, is, persists and how deportation that really violates fundamental concepts of American justice um, is widely accepted and, and is allowed to continue. So these two myths are the construction of immigrants as invaders uh, and, and also as criminal aliens. So this invasion myth has pretty much erased the history of the U.S. as an invader of Mexico, right? Where it actually went into Mexico, took lots of Mexico's land. You can see here in this um, sort of uh, reconstruction uh, depicting Pancho Villa, he's, he's depicted as an invader of, of the United States, a threat to Americans. Whereas, it, you know, and this sort of erases the history of U.S. involvement and why he, he even came into U.S. territory and the U.S. involvement um, and meddling in the, <laughs> the, um, the revolution, the Mexican Revolution at the time. Um, this is also manifested in, in current books like Alienation, where um, uh, the I sort of core central belief of the book is that migration, particularly from Mexico, threatens the core of American society. Okay, so he says things like the American nation has always had a specific ethnic core, and that core has been white. Um, and the white majority is not shrinking, um, but it's being inundated, right? And, and he really focuses on this inundation um, of, of immigrants, particularly from, from Mexico, and, and really sees that as, as a threat. So this is a very concrete manifestation of, um, you know, this fear of white power and white property being challenged by a, a shifting um, population. So um, this is a visual map uh, illustrating some of the white anxiety about desperately needing to kind of own that alternative narrative um, and investing in the myth of immigrants as invaders. 
So Swedish absolute makers ran this ad, and it was made for a Mexican audience and only run in Mexico. But because of the internet, um, it got out and it angered a lot of U white US citizens uh, by idealizing an early 19th century map showing a large portion of the US as Mexican. Um, we've seen artists try to combat this master narrative for years in such works as Yolanda Lopez's now famous print, it was the illegal alien pilgrim. Um, so a boycott unfolded from this absolute map, and um, <laughs> it takes up the anxiety. <laughs> so some of the reactions included absolute boycott, how to lose customers in an absolute world, class marketing screw up in an absolute world, and this shows all oh. <laughs> 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 or in an absolute world that's really exemplifying the border um, oh. keeping <laughs> kids out of the U.S. So. Um, another popular image that we all know from Southern California is this freeway sign. Um, and an interesting thing has happened with it in that people have appropriated the sign and this kind of now iconic imagery to express popular fears around immigration. So here we have warning, illegal alien invasion in progress, or below where the family is actually transformed into little, literal space and aliens. Um, and here, it's a clear example of how this imagery can be used to distort reality. Made by right-wing conservatives, the sign implies that Obama is somehow welcoming Mexican immigrants into the country, but in reality, he's deported more than any other president. Um, and we had tons of other signs we wanted to show because there have been so many riffs on this and a lot of art made from it, but just because of time constraints, we didn't include all of those, but it's a really interesting kind of phenomenon to start looking at and how the sign has been appropriated by both sides, kind of pro-immigrant and anti-immigrant. Um, so another part of this invader uh, mythology is that immigrants are bringing disease with them. And we saw this with Operation Wet Back, as you can see from that earlier uh, headline up there. Um, but it's being replicated now in the following Fox News coverage about the influx of children coming to the U.S. from Central America. So here the headline is, Hidden Danger if the Immigrant Kids Bring Disease to U.S. Um, diseases at the border, and it lists this <laughs> fairly scary list. Um, border agents overwhelmed by the wave of humanity entering the U.S. Uh, influx of illegals to Texas is like Hurricane Katrina. So here the kids are dangerous, but also kind of natural disasters. Um, and here, illegal dumping. You know, the I, I'd say this is probably the most innocent looking footage that Fox News has even chosen to feature. Mm -hmm. But here, even a child is a dangerous invader, um, a household pest, and someone to be dumped elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So in addition to this sort of uh, construct of immigrants as invaders, there's this, this uh, construct of immigrants as criminal aliens. So this is something President Obama said, where he really tries to set up this, this I would say, false dichotomy. So we try to focus our enforcement on people who generally pose a threat to our communities, not to hardworking families who are minding their own business, and oftentimes have members of their family who are US citizens. So it's almost, it, you know, it's pretty much saying, Criminal aliens, you know, do not have have families. When in reality, you know, there's a lot of overlap there. Where people who are deported, uh, based on criminal convictions, and hundreds of thousands of them have American citizen children. Uh, many of them, people who are labeled as criminal aliens under the ICE categories, uh, really haven't committed any crimes other than a traffic infraction. Mm -hmm. Others, a large percentage, have committed immigration offenses. So they've come into the country without permission, and that's their crime that then gets them labeled as, as a criminal alien and triggers uh, a lot uh, lower protections under the law. Uh, so this construction has changed over time. While Mexican immigrants used to be portrayed as predominantly workers, alienated and other as poor, uneducated, smiling aliens, now the more popular depiction is of criminals and threats appealing to fear. So here, the image on the left is from Life magazine in the 50s, and the caption for it says, Luz Gil of Mexico, smiling after being arrested for crossing the border into US illegally. So just think about that difference and what we're seeing now. I mean, you would never picture that caption or that image of just someone smiling and being deported. Um, so there's a major physical difference in the presentation of immigrants today, whereas earlier photographs like the one on the left showed families and individuals with smiling faces. They were humanized, even if othered. Now immigrants are shown in handcuffs with their back towards the camera or with somber faces and threatening looks so that they're criminalized and presented as guilty. 
Uh, and here are just a few more examples of these earlier photographs from Life magazine, and it really just shows kind of the, the wildly different presentation. Um, now we have these sens sensationalized reports and media imagery using photos that are reminiscent of criminal mugshots made to instill fear about immigrants. And you know, that top shot is from CNN and says revolving door, criminal illegals return to US, and obviously it's a scary picture. Wow. Um, yeah, so you can really see kind of the stark comparison there. And so th there are very real um, uh, impacts in terms of the law um, based on, on these conceptions. So um, people who are labeled as criminal aliens, um, like Hector Bar Barajas, who's uh, featured in this picture at the uh, Tijuana border, he leads a group called Banished Veterans, of, mm -hmm. of people who've actually served in the American military and have subsequently been deported um, based on criminal convictions. Um, but once people are have a criminal conviction um, that falls on, on a long list of crimes defined as aggravated felonies, which can be misdemeanors, uh, and, and as well as felonies, mm -hmm. um, then they no longer are, are sort of given the kinds of protections that we would generally expect in court. So um, deportation is often uh, mandatory, where a judge can't even consider ties to the United States, the fact that somebody speaks primarily English, has American citizen children, um, that that's all irrelevant because of changes to the law in 1996. Uh, deportation under this particular law is often permanent, so there's really no chance of ever returning to the United States, so it's a, a permanent banishment or exclusion. Um, even uh, sometimes people are sort of categorically excluded from even having the right to appear in immigration court, so it's all done administratively. Um, and, and then uh, even when people can appear in court, there are things like operations streamlined to prosecute um, cr criminally immigration violations that's kind of referred to as assembly line justice. So they're just groups of people who are massively informed of their constitutional rights. They give them out, they give them up, um, probably without really understanding what's going on. But there's this acceptance of these kinds of, of activities that I think would be blatantly unconstitutional if applied to, to different populations. Um, and then even more so, uh, immigrants, particularly Mexican immigrants, are so dehumanized that uh, they uh, are killed at the hands of US law enforcement with virtual impunity. So this is footage taken of um, a, a, a murder, a beating murder by U.S. Border Patrol agents in 2012 uh, when they were deporting somebody at the, the Tijuana border. Uh, and, and there also have been numerous, uh, 30 reports in recent years of Border Patrol agents shooting across the border into ne Mexico's territory and, and killing people. And there's been pretty much um, no, no, no steps taken to prevent that. So um, we wanted to look at artists and contemporary artists who are kind of doing something to try to change um, the way that, that immigrants are viewed, or at least to kind of question some of that, that narrative and history. So um, we only really have time to introduce one artist, but I'll show you a couple images from his series. So uh, artist and scripts professor Ken Gonzalez Day started to look into current imagery of Mexican immigrants and Mexican Americans and wanted to know more about where stereotypes and this criminalization was coming from. He saw a new form of vigilantism at the rise af at the border after 9-11 and wanted to look back at historical vigilantes. He re researched an often forgotten or silenced history of lynchings in the West and found that more Latinos were lynched here than that of any other race. So for his series, Hang Trees, Gonzalez Day visited over 300 of the lynching sites in California mm -hmm. using an old camera to document the remaining trees. He did so as a nod both to early landscape photography and the violence associated with westward expansion and the idea of manifest destiny. But besides bringing attention to this lesser known narrative, he also started to wonder what the people being lynched looked like. So um, for his 2007 portrait series, he hired models who matched the same age and physical description as the ones who were lynched at these various sites. He explained his project to them, they posed, and he set up these portraits opposite the photos of the hang trees in various ways. So sometimes he would pair them looking across the room at each other, kind of in a gallery space, so it's as if they're kind of in conversation. 
or he also used Photoshop to superimpose these images um, so that a living person reenacts and remind us, reminds us of murder via lynching mm -hmm. at a living tree that stands as kind of a testament and reminder to the violent crimes that were committed there. So he, with these photographs, we see more humanistic portraits. His models look directly at the camera as if claiming ownership over the gaze. They choose their poses, maintain power in the relationship between photographer and subject, and they're controlling viewership, and that they stare directly back to us, the viewers. So with these comparisons, Gonzalez Day raises serious critiques of current vigilantism along the border, as exemplified by groups like the Minutemen, while also humanizing and putting a face on the inhumane history of the past, forcing viewers to question and confront this violent racism of both the past and the present. Um, and he has oh, like three different series that kind of focus on uh, the hand trees and, and this, and he's a really great artist to look into. Um, and he's a historian too, so he does really interesting things where he writes a lot about it, so it's really contextualized and you can learn a lot via his art and writing. That's it. Wow, that was like 15 minutes. You're going to say. I guess I, I just do have a thing. So uh, prior to coming to law school, boring place, I, I worked as an immigrant rights organizer for eight years in Chicago. So and then my sort of uh, people that I worked with were uh, Asian and specifically Korean like youth uh, and immigrants. Uh, and it's, you know, I think you had mentioned a little bit about the, you know top ten countries like the, you know student uh, immigrants are deported to their home countries, including Cambodia. But mm -hmm. also like the Korea is one of I think according to the foreign ministry of uh, South Korea that because you know they know how many people had uh, you know come, had gone to the United States and either have converted their citizenship to legal permanent residency or like whether they become their citizens or legal permanent residents, then the rest of people whose visa expired, you know, they are remaining as like uh, undocumented. And mm -hmm. according to them, I think it's like one out of five Koreans like residing in the United States are undocumented. Mm -hmm. And then for Asian community, it sort of has this existential crisis in such a way that like, we're not a minority, we're like we're hard working and our, our children are acing in schools and math and science and doing everything awesome in high tech and whatever, but you know, in the shadows that like there are one out of five of us are like undocumented, like you know, living for cash jobs or like doing under the table stuff and then using you know, someone else's social security numbers or like, you know, all these crimes people associate with, let's say Mexicans only or Latinos only are committed by, you know, what, other mainstream society considers as model minority. And it's like that is, has a like shame factor to the even sort of a immigrant youth behavior. It I kind of takes a lot of like courage for them to be able to even like out themselves as undocumented, which is you know difficult for you know any youth. So I just wanted to probably ask you a little bit about, yeah, of course the imagery of the criminalized immigration uh, in the, in undocumented immigrants are f focused on Latinos, but then there have been any other work that you know of that sort of highlights, it's it's much more diverse than, than we would give credit for. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's such a conflict because it's like on the one hand focusing so much, particularly on deportations to Mexico and then the construct of immigrants as Latino, you know, almost like reinforces this widespread sort of tunnel vision about who, who are immigrants. Um, but then on the other hand, you know, I think it's like seventy five percent of people being deported are to Mexico, so it's, it's, it's this tension. And I do think that, you know, that there there is that that relationship in terms of the social consciousness. Um, but there is some great work coming out, and particularly in, that I've seen from Cambodia, that there's, there are a lot of people being returned there, returned even though many of them have never even lived there, like they were born you know, outside of the country in refugee camps, spent their whole life in the U.S., and then because they had a, a conviction for something, they've now been been returned there. Um, some great, um, uh, actually, videos that they've come up with sort of challenging this construct of them as un-American. And they talk about, um, it'll just snap from 
it's a studio called Studio Revolt, and it features, you know, these uh, clips of people with all of their childhood memories, like, hey, I remember Trader Joe's, Thanksgiving, <laughs> Halloween, and, and, you know, it really challenges this idea that they're un-American, because they are, you know, they're speaking English and, and all of that. Um, so that, that's, that, those are some great sort of uh, videos that I've seen. I haven't seen anything particularly about, um, like, Korean undocumented uh, people, or, and I don't know about how much deportation is going on, and probably some of it relates to like, you know, it's not on law enforcement's mind as much to interrogate the immigration status, so like, there's not as much enforcement directed there. Yeah, I guess uh, I remember probably most likely it's like some of all, I think, um, so let's just really be honest, like the massage parlors, mm -hmm. like all these like Asian owned ones, and like, you know, there are a lot more than massages are going on, so then those women who are either trafficked from Korea or who went through other countries and they come to that they would be the one likely to be either like you know, sort of through a crackdown and then deportation and then yeah sort of those things I think we we have worked with like uh, either the people in the deportation center in that setting more likely but of course it is true that because of the local police are in endowed with the power to ask anyone's uh, um, you know, uh, immigration status and then be able to report it and directly collaboration with ICE and like, that has. Uh, Asian youth, I think, deported or being detained has been a criminal law. Mm -hmm. Let me not really dominate the <laughs> conversation. Oh, yeah, I wanted to touch on um, when you guys mentioned the Operation Mudback, and I wanted to ask if the same tactics that were used back then are still used now to deport people. Because I know for a fact that back then they deported people who were US citizens or residents. and. Well, where I come from, the community, there has been cases where um, youth that are U.S. citizens have been deported. Yeah, certainly, and I think a lot of the problem is, you know, without um, um, immigration attorneys being provided, you know, sometimes you know things just happen so quickly. Sometimes they're happening outside of the court sphere. Um, but even if people are in court and they don't have representation, you know, things can fall through the cracks. So there certainly even now um, are it, uh, quite a few examples of people who are citizens who end up uh, deporting. There was a pretty publicized case of a man who uh, had some developmental disabilities. He was a citizen was deported, family couldn't find him for months, you know, just wandering the streets, sort of didn't know what to, what to do. Uh, and I think that um, there are some really strong parallels between the interior enforcement now, you know, during Operation Wetback, they set up like traffic stops, right? And, and they're doing that now in a lot of places where it's like these traffic stops designed to, to you know, sort of figure out who's allowed to stay in the United States. There's also been detention of, you know, people may, might not necessarily get deported because eventually they'll they'll figure out that they're citizens, but there has been kind of long-term detention and immigration detention of U.S. citizens. The place I used to work at, we represented a person who was a U.S. military vet who was detained for seven months, you know, the whole time being like, hey, I'm a U.S. citizen, you know, until they finally released him, you know. And so it's in Zach, because we sued on that case now, they have to automatically have a hearing right away if someone says they're a citizen, but they don't, and so citizens continue to be detained. Any other questions or comments? Oh, no, you got in. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, just a couple of things I was thinking about uh, listening to you all. Um, I don't know if you've read the, the work on the sort of Latino threat narrative, um, mm -hmm. Luis Chavez's work, but I was thinking about the sort of um, the, the verbal metaphors that come up a lot, like the martial metaphors of like inv invasion and defending the nation, and then the water metaphors of like a flood and a drowning. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if there's a way to kind of also split the imagery into or have those kind of categories of what are the types of metaphors being used? Because you know, the, definitely the water ones and the and the martial ones are, are, are huge, at least in in writing. Um, and so it might be interesting to see that tracked in images and see if there's any other kinds of metaphors coming up consistently. Um, might also be interesting to track sort of images of interior interior enforcement since that is so much of what's happening now versus the border enforcement, which I think are the more kind of traditional images. Um, mm -hmm. And so what does that look like? Uh, you know, those images of people being taken away from workplaces in their homes, a lot of that is interior enforcement. And is there a difference between that and the, and the enforcement images we see at the border? Um, and then, oh yeah, and then uh, when you had the images of Life magazine, of the mm -hmm. Bracero program, you, I was wondering like, how much of that is, is that there was 
uh, an existing you know, legal guest worker program at the time, and so it was kind of like uh, whitewashing the, the harms of that program to show that, that you know, people are happy uh, as guest workers in the country, um, and so maybe sort of exploring uh, that now that we don't, you know, whatever, we have a tiny, terrible guest worker program as opposed to a large, terrible one, uh, how much of that is, is based on the fact that the U.S. isn't trying to kind of excuse uh, undocumented labor, but instead uh, both profit from it, but also kind of erase it. Um, and then this, I hadn't seen this artist's work, this is super interesting, um, but it might be interesting to hear a little bit more on the background on the lynching, and like, well, was that, you know, mostly yeah, towards undocumented immigrants or towards all Latino immigrants, so just to have a little bit more context on, on what was happening at the time with the lynching, but you know, this is super powerful and really interesting. Um, and then just uh, another set of images, and I think this would be a whole other project, but just thinking about the images, uh, the, because we're hearing so much of um, post-deportation criminalization. Um, so in Haiti and even in Mexico and other countries where deportees are treated as criminals, like is there an imagery coming out um, uh, in, in the sort of receiving countries uh, that kind of tracks the, the same imagery we're seeing in the US? Yeah, that would be really powerful. Because it, it is like almost like the, the same construct that's being right. used in the US and then being exported. Right. Yeah. yeah. With US funding often. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like in El Salvador, we uh, just saw like the first prosecutions of parents who sent their children you know, to the US. So it's interesting how even the criminalization uh, has been exported to now like criminal prosecutions, you know, supported by the Obama administration in other countries of, of parents, you know. Which yeah. I didn't realize that. So they're prosecuting the parents. Yeah, prosecuting for parents for like endangering their children. Oh, yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so then I have a comment as well. Um, this artist is incredible and it's really stirring to see this work. And um, I guess I would, you know, when I'm looking at especially his portraits of these young men, the way he photographs them calls upon so much. I guess uh, what I think of is a long history of portraiture, how we look at a person, how, you know, the view, the angle from which we look at a person, where their gaze is, how the person is engaging us. And I think he, from my perspective, and I'm art history adjacent, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think I think he calls upon this gaze that we're, that we, when we look at a portrait, we're usually looking at sort of a noble person, or a person we're told to respect, and he's using that when we look at these folks. And I, I guess I would, be very interested to hear more about the art history and yeah. sort of the visual history. Yeah, no, I mean, it's funny because, you know, I used to portray the ownership of the gaze, and mm -hmm. Beth was asking me about that, um, and I just didn't think I had time to go into it, but it's really an art history kind of term for looking at portraiture, and so often, um, if we're used to seeing, say, women in paintings that are reclining nudes, they're usually looking away, and it gives the viewer then a position of ownership over their body and over like what's being presented. And so often in early portraiture, um, you, there's this concept of the gaze, and then like whoever is the viewer has power then over the person being presented. And so he's definitely combating that very purposely with this, where it's you know this direct eye contact and um, like you said, kind of this humanizing interaction then with the viewer. So he's doing that quite purposely and kind of building on a history and, and um, a real interaction and kind of dialogue about the gays that's really something that people bring up a lot in art history. Um, I think it's fascinating. He's looking down on us, mm -hmm. too. So mm -hmm. we're, you know, we're uh, lower status than he is when he looks at us in our picture. Yeah, he, he also got um, a Creative Capital grant to do um, a whole series that he called Profiled, and he went to like world famous museums all over the world and took pictures of their uh, permanent collections or coll archive collections that were often just in the basement and not being shown and then juxtaposed um, you know a sculptural head of a Maori person that had been made as kind of an anthropological study mm -hmm. with then a Greek statue and would have portrait or photographs of these mm -hmm. statues then staring down at each other and it was really to kind of juxtapose um, the history of colonialism and kind of question some of the practices that are really part of the museum now and mm -hmm. kind of the violence associated with the museum collection that doesn't get talked about very much um, and last I heard actually he was supposed to make one of those portraits a large mural um, 
at the LAPD uh, rampart oh. <laughs> building. <laughs> and I don't know what happened with that, but um, he he's a really he's an interesting um, a really interesting artist and historian. So, and I think another thing that's I mean I would I would listen to an hour of you talk about our history because I think it's fascinating. But another thing that you mentioned was that he calls upon sort of the tradition of landscape mm -hmm. literature. And do you, is there a reason that he does that? What is this sort of yeah, yeah? I mean, I, my personal take on that would be that um, a lot of early landscape painting in in the U.S. was done um, really symbolically to show kind of the righteousness of westward expansion. So a lot of times, landscape paintings show light sweeping into a dark wild wilderness and it's to show like kind of the civilization is moving in, in the right direction and um, kind of cleaning out you know Native American populations and that kind of thing so I think he was really trying to, to bring that about but um, in a really subtle way and he, he literally used a very old early camera to do all of these so he really was trying to kind of historicize it too. Um, and the other series that he did that's part of this is called the Erased Lynching Series. And so he took postcards of um, lynching events and then erased the person hanging so that it made it, it flipped it so that it was actually about the spectators who were watching it. And the idea of, you know, the fact that a postcard was made and he was sending these postcards kind of really um, problematizes that, that lynch mob mentality too. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now then uh, we'll probably here who wants to pick a podium or the front row. Take it. Oh, that's great. That's good too. Do you want to? Um, prior to um, teaching at Washington Law School, she worked with Northwest Immig Immigrant Rights Project in Seattle. And her seven years there, she uh, provided uh, legal services, immigration legal services, as well as represented um, immigrant survivors of violence. Welcome, mm -hmm. um, and directed one of yeah. So. Then I think from, of course, her days at NILP and NWIRP, I have like looked up this uh, interesting article. Of, so more than 700 people detained at the Northwest Detention Center in Tacoma in a hunger strike. I think I would like to show a little bit more about that. But And then in protest of their conditions, and in a public statement, the hunger strikers demanded an end to deportations and the separation of families. He also demanded better food, medical care, and wages for work inside the facility. They currently receive just one dollar a day for their labor. Uh, and an end, end to commissary prices. Detainees pay $8.95 for a bottle of shampoo and a dollar for a single plastic plate. Which, yeah, it was sort of a, that the article when, when it was talking about it, like being all these uh, undocumented um, immigrants and the detainees in the detention centers are not really necessarily the, like, so it is replicated in, like, local jails and entire, like, prison, you know, prison system that we have in the United States. It was, like, sort of a, and, and then how we bring it back that these are the most urgent human rights movement in our country. And and she, I, I was really impressed. Of course, it's my personal opinion. But then, I mean, she will probably say a little bit more about the criminalization and then undocumented um, or immigration as well. And then what it brings on. So. Thank you, Catherine. Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, so, my name is Angelica Chasaro, and I am uh, currently working as a visiting assistant professor. Um, and as Kat says, uh, before I did this work, I worked for seven years as a staff attorney at a legal services organization called the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project. And this work really comes out of that work of that year, those years of being a practitioner. Um, you know, for most of the people who were seeking help from the organization that I worked for, uh, who came through the North, their, their main question was like, how can I get my papers? And 
for almost all of them, uh, the answer was you can't. There was nothing under the current immigration laws that allowed them to, to get status. Um, and yet, you know, cyclically about every year or so, we'd see a new uh, immigration reform uh, 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 proposal. Um, and I realized that even for many of the people who did qualify, they would not qualify under the new legalization proposal because the people who worked with were low income people of color, often with criminal convictions, um, often uh, very poor people who would receive public benefits in one form or another. Um, and so that question, that, that kind of tension, is, is what, what led me to this work. Um, the, because the strategy of most of the mainstream immigrant rights organizations um, and you know the Democratic Party and most unions is to seek this sort of legalization strategy. Mm -hmm. And yet, for so many people, this wouldn't actually end up being a benefit. And for some of them, it might uh, make things worse. Um, and so this kind of urgent need to examine uh, and respond to the effects of immigration policy on those who are most vulnerable to its harms is what sort of animates this project. Um, and so to start, I just want to talk briefly about what are these harms of living without lawful status and. Um, the, the Caldwell did a great job of that, so I won't uh, go into that in, in, in great uh, detail. Um, but three of just kind of the big harms is, you know, this constant threat of removal or the threat of removal. Um, you know, there was a, this deportation. Um, as we know, there's higher level of enforcement than ever before. Um, and uh, there's huge harms that, that result when, when someone is removed. Um, detention, um, there was no immigration imprisonment. Um, you know, there's a 34,000 bed mandate currently, so Congress is mandating that 34,000 detention beds exist daily, and ICE, uh, Immigration Customs Enforcement, is understanding this to mean that 34,000 people have to be detained every day, and so that's what we're seeing. Um, you know, there's tremendous harms related to detention, so much so that, as Kat talked about, there was a, a hunger strike that lasted 56 days in the closest detention center to Seattle, uh, where people were basically starving themselves to protest the harms uh, that they were facing in detention. Um, and then, of course, workplace exploitation. Um, the undocumented population is about 5.4% of the U.S. labor force and 10% in states like California, Arizona, and Nevada. Um, and because of their undocumented status, often are subject to the whims of their employers um, and are overrepresented in some of the most dangerous and difficult jobs in the U.S. Um, and so the harm there is everything from uh, workplace injuries to wage theft. Um, and so we could you know, spend an entire 15 minutes talking about these harms <laughs> and, and talking about other harms. But I do also just want to highlight that these harms, uh, as the Caldwell's talk about, are distributed along these lines of race and class. Um, and so even though 40% of people who are undocumented in the U.S. are visa overstayers, which means that you know, they entered the U.S. With, with inspection and had a reason to be here initially and then overstayed, most of the uh, immigration enforcement is focused on people who are known as Kiwis or people who enter without inspection in the U.S. Um, and that definitely has a race and class component because people who are able to enter lawfully often are people uh, with money or people with lighter skin uh, because of the way that the visa system works. Um, and so, uh, what happens with, with, with these harms that exist, the proposed solution that is often brought forward is legalization. So, you know, given these harms, the solution to the harms is, is talked about as, well, let's move all the people that we can away from this category of undocumented because they're receiving these harms as, as, because they're unauthorized migrants to the category of documented by having some sort of legalization program. Um, but what we're seeing, what I talked about is, previously is that the strategies used to advocate for legalization end up excluding those that are most likely to bear the brunt of the harms, and I'll talk about what that means in a second, um, and actually end up increasing those harms. So it's not just that, that they'll exclude people, um, but that for those who are left out of the circle of legalization, the harms actually increase as a result of the compromises that are made. Um, so I want to take a second just to talk about uh, how we ended up here, and so again, the Caldwell's talked about uh, you know the, this sort of anti-immigrant animus that has <laughs> pervaded uh, throughout throughout the decades, and is particularly uh, acute right now. And so the response to this, um, immigrant advocates have unsurprisingly embraced respectability as an obvious response to this imagery depicting unauthorized immigrants as sort of threats to the nation. Um, and so the many negative stereotypes that have been met with the deployment by immigrant advocates of blanket stereotypes of immigrants as hardworking, law-abiding, uh, family-loving people. Um, and so the politics of respectability, the work it does, um, is kind of squarely in line uh, with, with, with the recurrent civil rights dynamic and other movements as well. Um, and it's this idea that a stigmatized group, in this case undocumented immigrants, need to make every effort to present themselves so as to enhance the reputation of the group and distance themselves from negative stereotypes 
And the idea is if they're able to do this and present themselves above reproach, those in power will have no choice but to recognize them as fully human, productive members of society, and maybe grant them lawful status. Um, and the onus in the politics of respectability is on ending the harm, the, the onus of ending the harm of lack of lawful status is on those experiencing the harm through individual action and personal responsibility. So it's not, you know, it's not a system that, that's, that's broken, it's the individual that's broken, and it's their responsibility to be the best version of themselves so as to eventually uh, merit legalization. Um, and this is really deployed by everybody from heads of unions to immigrant advocacy groups to immigrants themselves. So it's very common not to see at immigrant rights marches as a sign of people saying, you know, we're, we're workers, not criminals, we're here to work. And so people really have internalized these messages as well. Um, so because of time limitations, I'll just focus on number one, that the we are not criminals. Um, uh, but there's, there's things to say about all of these and more. Um, so here's just a couple of quotes uh, that, that I think really um, capture this, this uh, politics of respectability in action. So the first one is by the president of the AFL-CIO, who's been a, a champion of immigrant rights. And he said, when the president told us he was going to only go after criminal aliens, we all said, okay, go do that. But don't go after people whose only crime is that they're living here undocumented. Um, the second is by Ali Nurani, who's the executive director of the National Immigration Forum, one of the largest immigrant advocacy groups. Um, he says, we are all for detaining criminals, but those now on supervised release are the kind of people who should never have been in detention in the first place. Um, and these are pretty typical statements. Um, you know, and you see this kind of at every level from uh, pro-immigrant Congress members to heads of unions to heads of, uh, to, to kind of immigrant advocates themselves. Um, and so clearly here, you know, I, I believe that Nurani and Trumka and others they recognize the harms of detention and deportation. That's not an issue. Um, but their resistance to it, as shown by these quotes, has been based on what is thought to be this overbroad use of the category of criminal alien. So in questioning removals and detention, advocates like Trinka and Nirani uh, question not the fact of removal and detention itself, but rather that they've been misled as to who is going to be removed. Um, likewise, immigrant advocates frequently ground their opposition to the existence of detention in the idea that immigrants are not criminals and therefore do not deserve to be locked up. So this kind of argument presupposes the existence of a population that does merit detention and deportation. And it relies on the notion that the harms of detention are not harmful per se, but harmful because they're being uh, applied to the, a category of respectable innocence. Um, it doesn't question the category of criminal alien at all or any of the policies that led to contact to, uh, with the criminal legal system to begin with that then leads to contact with, with deportation mechanisms. And so the things that remain in question are the harsh drug laws and sentencing laws, the high levels of racial profiling, the disproportionate likelihood that men of color will be arrested for deportable offenses. All of these remain unquestioned when the argument against the number of deportations under Obama is limited to deporting, to protesting the deportation of, of the respectable. Um, how am I doing on time? You're doing really great. Wonderful. <laughs> you have about still seven minutes left. Wonderful. Okay. Um, and so I'll talk for a second then about the, the second one, the, the We Are Hard Workers. Um, and so this is, you know, often deployed side by side with the We Are Not Criminals, We Are Workers, um, sometimes just on its own. Um, and so pro immigrant advocates have taken the basis for immigrants' exploitation, their status as vulnerable laborers, and turned it around, kind of embracing the identity of immigrants as hard workers to justify their claims for immigrant inclusion. Um, unauthorized immigrants labor precarity leads them to work, as I said, in some of the most difficult conditions in the U.S., whether in the fields or in meat packing or fruit packing factories. Um, and it's the very difficulty of this labor and immigrants' commitment to their employment that's head up, held up as proof of why they're deserving of status. Um, so advocates, you'll often see language describing their labor as honest and as backbreaking, on, on, often in the same sentence. And this is also a deployment, uh, I argue, of the politics of respectability, where immigrants' sort of potential brokenness, their potential to, to be broken by their difficult labor, absolves them of this original sin of entering the country without status to begin with. Um, so under this hard worker rhetoric, unauthorized immigrants pose dishonesty at crossing the border without legal authorization can only be forgiven by dint of you know, exchanging this hard labor. And this, again, of course, limits any challenges to a system of labor that would require and depend on the exploitation of a vulnerable and precarious workforce. You know, and so we start to see some of the limitations uh, that, that we have when we, when we take on the, the politics of respectability. The asks that we make end up being quite limited. Um, and so that said, what, what is the alternative? Uh, legalization has been sort of, uh, the strategy has been pushed for for so long, and it's, I think, something that's very hard to, to let go of. 
Um, what I want to uh, suggest is that there is actually a, a, a other possibilities outside of legalization, and that this is actually a good moment to start thinking about them, given the most recent failure of comprehensive immigration reform efforts. Um, and so I have sort of a, a two-part approach that I want to suggest. Um, Part one, uh, you know, takes kind of the lead from the medical profession's, uh, you know, exhortation to first do no harm. And so I suggest that the question that scholars and activists and advocates and, you know, Congress, Congress, members of Congress should ask when crafting an intervention, a legal intervention or otherwise, is would this intervention increase the harms associated with illegality, the harms that I talked about at the beginning, facing unauthorized migrants? Um, so in other words, would achieving the proposed change make life harder for unauthorized immigrants who stay outside of those protections? Um, would the reform make the category of illegality a more lethal one for those who remain outside? Um, and, and this really is, is kind of a switch from what we've seen. It's kind of a direct repudiation of the politics of respectability because it requires centering the kind of unpopular, unpalatable, unrespectable, uh, so immigrants with disabilities, criminal convictions, uh, gender nonconforming immigrants, people who aren't married, people who don't have US citizen children, uh, the unemployed. These groups are the starting point of the analysis if you take on this sort of question. Um, and so what I do in my paper is, is, is apply this question to the most recent uh, Senate bill that would have, uh, that, you know, if, if, if it had been recon reconciled with a much worse House bill, would have led to, to massive immigration reform. And so this, this bill at 744 did pass last year. And so I asked the question, so would adoption of, of this bill have increased the harms of illegality for those who remain outside of its protections? And the answer, you know, unsurprisingly, is a, a resounding yes. Um, so the Caldwell's talked about some of this, but uh, you know, so it would have subjected unauthorized migrants entering the U.S. to early death because of the uh, enormous militarization of the border that it required. Uh, there's already more than one death a day happening at the border. There were 445 deaths last year, and the further militarization of the border would have led, I think, uh, most definitely to, 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 to early death for those who have not even yet arrived. For people already, uh, for people who were apprehended at the border, it would have uh, they would have been uh, exposed to prolonged incarceration. The Caldwell's talked about Operation Streamline, and, and this bill would have expanded that, um, and so people would have faced long sentences up to 15 years <laughs> for for entering the U.S. Uh, unlawfully. People who are already here would have been subject to increased immigration enforcement because the bill continued to fund programs like secure communities through expanding uh, a program called SCAP, which basically uh, gives money to local uh, to local uh, law enforcement for holding immigrants for ICE custody. Um, and it would have uh, increased uh, the exploitation that, that undocumented workers are subject here, the workplace exploitation, because it would have made mandatory the implementation of something called EBS, the Electronic Verification System, uh, which basically would have created something like a national ID card, at least for immigrants, and may have been the first order to, to a, a national ID card for all. Um, and uh, so it would have become more difficult than ever to get a uh, job without uh, lawful status. Um, so those who were able to get work would have been kind of stuck in those jobs because it, it, the, 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 the uh, nationwide um, adoption of electronic uh, employment verification systems uh, will simply lead to, to more workplace exploitation. Um, and not only that, but actually the bill would have guaranteed all these harms that I described by conditioning the legalization aspects, so the aspects that would have granted, you know, uh, some of the 11 million here stat status eventually, all of that is conditioned on the government fully adopting these practices above. And so there had to be 90% control of the border, there had to be 100% implementation of this new electronic verification system. So there are all these kind of triggers that needed to be in place before people could even start to legalize. Um, and so it definitely fails this first to no harm uh, question. Um, and so clearly, uh, I, th I think that intervention is important asking this question, but I, I don't think it's necessarily enough. Um, we need to do more than refuse invitations to expand harm. We need to imagine that we could possibly decrease the harms. Um, and so that's where the second part of my approach comes in. Um, and this is based on, again, on the public health field and ideas of harm reduction. So this question asks, a question mark, but imagine it's there, which interventions could actively decrease the harms of living without lawful status? Um, and so here, I'm calling for this positive strategy shift from how can we put the undocumented on a pathway to citizenship to how can we re reduce the harms related with living under undocumented status for those who remain in that status? And so it, it becomes a very different question. 
Um, and you know, here I take insights from the harm reduction approach to drug use, and so this is a set of principles and procedures developed around encouraging reduction of harm to drug use or families and their communities. Um, and some of the principles here are neutrality, pragmatism, humanism, and redu reduction of risk and vulnerability. Um, I won't go into these right now in great detail, but suffice to say this would be quite a change from our current uh, approach to, to immigration. Um, uh, and so, unlike the politics of respectability, if we're looking at decreasing the harms related to illegality, um, the politics of respectability hides or ignores those most vulnerable to the harms of illegality. This, this approach takes as its focus, as its very subject, those most vulnerable to those harms. So again, people with criminal convictions, with disabilities, the unemployed, the unmarried, uh, they become the subjects and the agents of an intervention rather than being pushed aside as sort of inconvenient to a movement based around poster children. Um, and so I'll end with just a couple of time. All right, a couple of possible applications. And so what is this looking like right now? I think this is already happening in, in some ways. And so we've seen um, states uh, that have expanded the access to driver's license bills. Um, and so eight states in the past three years have expanded uh, access to driver's license. Uh, prior to SB 107, the anti-immigration law in Arizona only, uh, Arizona, only two states provided licenses, and now that number is growing pretty much every year. Um, and so I think that these uh, these grants of driver's licenses reduce the vulnerability, one of the vulnerabilities of, of being undocumented on a population level as well as an individual level. Um, and it passes the first you know, harm test. It doesn't render illegality more harmful to grant everybody driver's licenses. There's no harmful trade-off. Um, and it refuses to leave anybody out of the sphere of inclusion. So I think it is this harm reduction measure. And finally, um, I think advocacy to end immigrant imprisonment. And I put immigrant in, in parentheses because I think this could also lead to partnerships between those fighting mass incarceration and immigration detention. Um, because when you stop basing a movement around sort of poster children and denying criminal alienhood or denying the folks in, in your community who, who do have contact with the criminal system, you can actually look systemically at the harms of detention and make important linkages between the, the fight against mass incarceration and the fight against um, immigrant detention. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, I really welcome feedback. Uh, so um, there's my email. Um, yeah. Thank you for speaking. Sure. So fast, and then like still. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So is there any? I think we still have. We have just only last presenter, Nela. So okay. I think we can probably ask. I think there was like, a lot of information. It was a lot of questions. And then the first question came to mind was that. So I think you were the one of the advisors who kind of uh, worked with the White House to to fashion out DACA, like so administrative proceedings for any minor. So from the perspective of do no harm and reduce harm, like what would you see that like falling into? Mm -hmm. And then also failing a comprehensive immigration reform that I think uh, the immigration right immigrant rights groups were trying to kind of uh, expand the DACA like to be broadly applicable, which failed of course politically, but then what would you what what would be your sense of where that fall into? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So the, the expansion of kind of executive authority to provide people immigration status, I think it does fall within the sort of uh, harm reduction because it, it, it isn't premised on a trade-off. It's not that more people were deported because DACA was put in place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a little bit tricky because under DACA, uh, kind of new grounds that we've never seen, uh, you know, uh, for the, like, particularly serious crime, serious misdemeanor, making it so that if you had three DUIs, you weren't able to qualify for DACA. So that those kinds of grounds, were put into DACA that didn't exist before. So in some ways, even the expansion of DACA introduced the possibility that in the future, other sorts of crimes would, would, would render people um, removable. But so far, we, we haven't really seen it apply to other spheres. And so I do think that DACA and executive action is generally an example of um, immigrant-led uh, pushes for, for relief that don't rely on a trade-off of expanding deportations for others. And I think the push for um, expand, expanding DACA and expanding sort of executive action in general that is coming really from the grassroots is, is part of that same movement. There, you know, the, the not one more deportation movement, um, the call for moratorium on, 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 on deportation and, and the end of uh, detention or the end of detention as we know it, all of that isn't premised on the trade-off. And so I do see it as fitting into this, although it does get complicated because 
DACA and expanded DACA for all also is, is you know, it's, it's still a very individual remedy where the government, mm -hmm. we're inviting the government to make individual rulings on, on whether someone is deserving or undeserving. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it will end up splitting people off and, and the people left behind are not necessarily the ones who are going to be centered moving forward. Uh, but I, I at least see immigrant uh, grassroots organizers really aware of this in a way that, that the mainstream groups are, are only now catching up to. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay. So, uh, I want to talk about the concept of family unity. Because when, when I came into the, my family and I came in the 60s, and yeah. I was legalized while I was a little baby, you know, and it was all under the concept of family unity and that principle, and we shifted completely away from it. I think there's a strong you know, public health argument about the family, the well being of the family. And is there any way do you think that? we can shift away from the issue of, you know, legalization based on like what's a criminal alien, what's not a criminal alien, the issue of, you know, a immigrant, a the immigrant's value based on the ability to work. Shift away from that and focuses on the issue of family unity again. The, I mean, I think those are the principles why I saw them more humane aspects of immigration reform, but we had a focus on family unity. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I definitely think it's a really useful frame. And it's you know, it's something visceral that, that really reaches people and that, that they understand. Um, I think, you know, one of the greatest harms of of, of, of illegality is, is this kind of breaking of family unity. And so, so I, I see it falling under that. Of, you know, the harms of deportation is is this sort of severing of, of family unity. Um, I think, you know, I, I get a little bit wary sometimes of family unity, uh, particularly doing work uh, with LGBT communities and the sort of limited uh, conceptions we have of family. Uh, and so I, I think part of me is, is, is thinking about ways to kind of expand family unity, sort of community unity, um, or, or how can we think about belonging in ways that, that aren't premised on sort of patriarchal family formations, because historically it's been so limited who can, who can qualify under the family unity grounds. And um, so I think those would be some of my worries, but I think um, kind of focusing on, on the harm done to family unity would definitely fit, fit under my, my framework. Sure, please. Yeah, I guess I have two overarching um, questions. One is, I mean, is you kind of clearly, I think your paper suggests a move away from a utilitarian approach. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess my first question is kind of, but there's not any, and you make some suggestions about the, the particular harms in S um, in S uh, seven four four, but I was wondering if there was any other kind of like normative um, grounds to away from utilitarian approach if we live in a different political environment. Mm -hmm. And kind of the second reason I'm saying this is because well, the your first principle of do no harm um, is uh, is suggested. I think it's even unworkable under your approach because many of the remedies you suggest. Mm -hmm often open themselves up to other potential harms. We could even take something as not just as driver's licenses, which could be, say, linked to um, databases by which federal immigration authorities could um, could go after folks that they want to, you know, that they, they intend to go after. Or um, if your concern is, is say, um, profiling of immigrant communities, there's been compromise made within the driver's license bills with regards to smart licenses. So those increase as well. So even on the level of the non-harm interventions you suggest, there are always utilitarian choices there. So I, I just wonder why not push that? Why, where's the limit of the utilitarian choices? Um, and does, is, is that a workable limit? Um, and if it's not, why not um, be even more kind of like over, overall pragmatic in terms of trying to maximize the harm for the greatest uh, number possible and use that as a first principle? Try to maximize the, the, the end of harm for the greatest number of Yes. I see. Um, so, yeah, uh, th those are really well taken points. Um, the driver's license example it is a problem because of the, of the, of the questions that you point out. Um, I do see sort of the, the, the pragmatism of the, the harm reduction approach really, really for me is, is a pragmatic approach. And so, you know, in the, in the drug arena, the, the Greatest example is this sort of the, the needle exchange programs that kind of accept the, the existence of, of, of drug use and, and reduce the harms related to it. Um, and so I think what, what I'm trying to do here is sort of accept the existence of an, of an undocumented population um, in ways that doesn't further criminalize them. Um, and so I, I do think there, 
while I do see some of the, some of the, the shortcomings of the driver's license, um, or the possible shortcomings of the driver's license example, um, because uh, the harm reduction approach really, I think, takes its lead from those who are most affected. Um, if immigrant communities are pushing forward uh, efforts to have driver's licenses because they see that as reducing some of some of their harms, I'm more prone to back that approach than an approach that's sort of a top-down approach from from large unions or from uh, organizations like like the Immigration Forum that really aren't taking their lead from from grassroots organizers. Um, and so, you know, I, what I see this approach tracking is really just sort of a flipping of the sort of immigration advocacy that that, that has traditionally happened, which is. Um, has been uh, very top down uh, to an approach where those most affected by uh, the harms of, of, of lack of immigration status are the ones now pushing the, the solutions. Um, and even though the solutions will have limits, um, I prefer to back those solutions and the solutions um, that that basically trade off entire segments of the undocumented population uh, to maximize uh, you know a good for for, uh, for another large portion of us as well. Because I don't think we're coming back for those who are left out. It just historically has not happened. In fact, the harms have expanded uh, for those who are left out. Um, it just I think working kind of you know social justice does not trickle down. It just I think it can trickle up, but it definitely does not uh, trickle down. Um, <laughs> And so uh, if we have this sort of trickle-up approach, if we, if we respond to the needs of people who are labeled criminal aliens, then it's likely to benefit all immigrants. Whereas if we respond to the needs of you know, people with, who are married with U.S. citizen children, who are, are hardworking, the needs of those who are left out of that paradigm uh, are not likely to ever be uh, addressed. With that, I guess we used to have all of yours last minute, so it's us that I switch. And I can introduce myself on the other side of my Thank you, exactly. So, um, so I think we had kind of gone to start on lynching to <laughs> uh, deportation, and then now our, our last presenter name, I will end with human trafficking. So that's sort of, uh, that also touches upon immigration in a different sense, and like that will be a really very good conclusion to our um, presentation today. And then I guess I don't really know, we don't really have an official bio, I know about Nela, especially she's a really eloquent public speaker, and she has already had a very uh, developed sense of a critical race lens and how to apply it to very different like, legal frameworks. So I was really all wild by always her like the way she uh, she have presented at different panels and discussions. So then I you. know that she worked as a union organizer. So mm -hmm. okay. let us move on to hers. Uh, hi, I'm Nyla Ren. I'm an associate at Old New York and Martinez and Quinones, a labor and employment firm here in LA. And um, before that, I was a union organizer for a very long time and was the director of organizing at Screen Actors Guild. Um, so I, I like labor rights. <laughs> you could say. So something I had the privilege of working on last summer was a case at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission out of Los Angeles. And the case involved um, a group of Thai workers who had been trafficked into the United States. Um, I'm using that as my case study for uh, this presentation. But what was so interesting about that case is it was a Title VII claim. So it was an employment discrimination claim that the Thai workers were bringing against their traffickers and the farms that employed them when they were trafficked. And that's a very new emerging legal strategy. It's a very different way to use Title VII. So um, first I'm going to give a little bit of background about human trafficking, just very briefly, if I can figure out how you call this. There we go. OK, so a little bit of background about human trafficking. So we are taught, and I think it's particularly relevant when we talk about whiteness of property and from CRS, we're taught that human trafficking is uh, basically sex trafficking. And um, I wanted to show a clip from Dateline that was uh, an hour-long special on trafficking that focused on a kidnapped white woman from Central California. Now, if you look at the statistics about human trafficking from the UN and from the Department of Labor, these are not the people who are being trafficked, and this is not the way that people are being trafficked. The people who are being trafficked are generally people of color, they're generally undocumented, or they are immigrants who are brought through visa programs and forced to overstay their visas. They are laborers, uh, and they are mostly female, but also quite a few men. 
Labor trafficking is much more prevalent than sex trafficking in the United States, and uh, labor trafficking is sort of hidden in plain sight. So we see trafficked people, we interact with them all the time, and we do not know the conditions of their labor. So the case that um, I had the privilege of working on was called EEOC versus Global Horizons. Global Horizons is a labor recruiter that um, was employed by several farms in the United States. And they uh, recruited people from various countries. In this case, they sent recruiters to Thailand, and specifically to a northern province of Thailand where most people's native language is Lao, and they have Lao ethnicity. It's a very small province. The land is barely arable. Um, people are subsistence farmers for the most part. People live on very small plots of land with their family and grow only enough food for them to eat. And these are the people who were targeted for trafficking for a couple of reasons. Because they were poor, but also because of the fact that they spoke mostly Lao, they would have a very difficult time making connections in the United States and a very difficult time escaping from captivity. So they were recruited. Um, they were told that they would make $10 an hour in the United States, that they would be able to work 12 hours a day, that they would be guaranteed three years of employment, that they would be brought in legally under a visa program, and that they would be given permanent immigration status after three years. They were told to pay anywhere from 300,000 to a million Thai baht, which is anywhere from 10,000 to $80,000. Uh, the average Thai salary is uh, $3,500 a year. So you can imagine someone's paying 10, 20 times their yearly salary for the opportunity to be recruited for these programs. The way that they would pay this money is, of course, they would give all their savings. They would sign their landowner as collateral to the, the traffickers, to Global Horizons. And then they would also take loans out from local loan sharks who were connected to Global Horizons and would be given kickbacks. So suddenly their land is held by the traffickers, um, and they are signed up on H-2A visas and brought to the U.S. They enter with inspection, um, and they arrive on these farms in Washington State and in Hawaii. And on the farms, they are put in dormitories that are meant for four people, and you know, 30, 40 Thai workers are put in these dormitories. They're sleeping on the floor. They are not allowed to leave. They're transported every day to the farms. They work, um, they work to impossible work quotas that they can never meet. When they fail to meet their quotas, their pay is docked. Their food is purchased by the trafficking company, and the amount, the price for food is subtracted from their pay. The cost of their transportation to the work site is subtracted from their pay. The cost of their rent to live in these squalid dormitories is subtracted from their pay. And so at the end of a few months, they end up owing the trafficking company money. And the trafficking company seizes their land and then starts charging their families rent on their farms back in Thailand. The debts keep increasing. And uh, these Thai workers know that if they try to escape, they will be deported. Uh, because when you're on an H-2A visa, your status in the US is tied to your employer. Mm -hmm. So they have no option to leave. Uh, they're also told by, their, by the traffickers, they're psychologically manipulated. They're told, we picked you because you're compliant. We know Thai people do what they're told. If you don't do what you're told, we'll have you arrested, we'll have you thrown in prison, or we'll send you back to Thailand where the loan sharks will come after you and break your legs and throw your family off the land. So, after months and months of living in this kind of terrible captivity and being psychologically abused, uh, also, I should mention, the, there were another group of workers on these same farms who were undocumented Mexican workers. And these workers were actually paid more and lived in very different conditions than the Thai workers, which is something that made the EEOC suit possible, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. But after months of this, uh, the Thai workers uh, escaped in various ways. Many of them jumped off moving buses. Many of them escaped at night. At various points, armed guards were hired to keep them in the dormitories, um, but many of them did escape, and then the ones who didn't escape were abandoned on a pig farm in Utah. A very kind farmer called the Department of Labor and said, I think there's been a violation here. <laughs> the Department of Labor said, yeah, we think so. And a series of criminal and civil suits ensued. None of the criminal suits were successful. The last remaining suit is the EEOC, who sort of did a Hail Mary legal theory and has been successful in getting millions of dollars for these workers. So just briefly, there are remedies for trafficked people. But uh, my argument in this paper is that these remedies are not working. And Title VII is actually probably a better remedy for trafficked people. 
So the 13th Amendment obviously has made indentured servitude and slavery illegal, but courts have held, including the Supreme Court, that that definition of slavery and servitude is limited to African-style slavery, and that's the quote the Supreme Court gave. So someone's got to be literally chained up and beaten and consent to no part of their servitude in order to, to say that their 13th Amendment rights have been violated. So that case is... I mean, that case comes from a situation in which two mentally disabled men were kept on a farm for 10 years and forced to sleep in a barn and were not paid, and they lost because it wasn't African style slavery. So clearly, the conception of you know, the 13th Amendment, the jurisprudence, is crazy. Then George Bush passed the Trafficking Victims Protection Act um, about 15 years ago, and this was proposed as a comprehensive remedy for victims of trafficking. However, our friend George Bush passed it, so of course it's, it doesn't work. It's designed for victims of sex trafficking. It's designed for people who were kidnapped, who consented to no part of being brought to the US, no part of their labor. It's designed for people who were coerced or physically forced into labor. And as you can tell from the Global Horizons case, people can be psychologically manipulated and lied to, but that doesn't necessarily meet the legal definition of coercion or force. Um, there's a protective element that was added to it, which is the T visa program. But for many immigration practitioners, you know that the T visa program, you have to show such a high bar. You have to show a severe form of trafficking, which basically means someone has to be in chains. So that, that is a false remedy. And then a civil claim was added as well. But the, there's many problems with the civil private right of action, um, including the damage awards are limited to a calculation of minimum wage for the hours worked. So the trafficking victim has to prove how many hours they worked. And then their labor is so devalued, they're only given federal minimum wage for it, which speaks a lot to how we value immigrant and female labor. Uh, but no one gets overtime. Uh, the damage awards are so small that no lawyers want to take these cases. So we're basically relying on legal aid practitioners and government lawyers. So there's no private incentive for people to take these cases. And the victims are not granted immigration status during the suit, so half the time they're deported before the suit ends anyway, because the civil suit lasts for five years. So there's only been 18 cases, civil cases, brought since this, uh, in the last like 15 years. So it's obviously not working. Uh, there's other remedies too that people have tried to use, Fair Labor Standards Act, um, the Alien Tort Claims Act, some RICO suits, and some state tort lawsuits to varying levels of success. The reason I oh, let me go to my next one. I think Title VII is a much better remedy for several reasons. I'm going to quickly make my case because I'm running out of time. Uh, so trafficking is obviously a crime that implicates race, gender, and national origin. These Thai people were targeted not just because they were Thai and because of racist assumptions about Thai people, but because they were from a specific region and were of a specific ethnicity in Thailand that made them more vulnerable. So when we talk about trafficking, we have to talk about race. We have to talk about gender. Also, they're put in a line of work which is really restricted to people of color and it's an undervalued field in which labor violations go completely unchecked. That's also an act of racism. Also, the reason Title VII is a great fit for this kind of violation is because when a person is trafficked, there are generally many claims under Title VII that fit the conditions of the person's confinement. So with the uh, Global Horizons workers, we saw harassment, we saw disparate treatment, they were paid less than non-Thai workers, they were treated differently, uh, they were made to feel badly about their ethnicity and about their national origin. The harassment was very specific to their national origin. Um, I'm just gonna make my case a little bit more. So in addition, there's a lot of procedural flexibility with Title VII claims. You get a long time to find your class of people, and if it's an EEOC case, you can add multiple claims. In addition, the statute of limitations is longer, so you have a longer time to find vulnerable workers who may or may not have been deported or maybe living somewhere else. Um, the remedies are more victim-centered. And the thing I find most compelling is the jurisprudence, there's a lot of jurisprudence and there's a lot of history of large damage awards under Title VII. Mm -hmm. The idea behind Title VII was to create a financial deterrent to make it 
not cost effective for employers to discriminate and allow harassment of workers. And so we see multi-million dollar verdicts and it's pretty normal. And employers factor this in to the cost of doing business. They say, well, we don't want Title VII violations, so we're going to preventatively act and have sexual harassment trainings and racial harassment trainings. And so if people start using Title VII as a remedy for human trafficking, employers will be forced to calculate the cost of violating these laws into the cost of doing business, and it will deter this exploitation of workers. That's my fantasy. Will that come to you? <laughs> Who knows? But I will say, criminal prosecutions are few and far between. And when we're talking about human trafficking, we are talking about an established criminal industry. Do you really think that a narcotics trafficker or a human trafficker is going to be deterred by a criminal penalty that they will probably never see? And if a criminal penalty comes along, they've got a fallback for it. That's absolutely not going to work. So I think the best chance we have is a financial deterrent and a, an area of law that's enough of a financial deterrent that private lawyers are willing to take cases because the verdicts can be very large. Also, you know, with Title VII, people take on contingency. So workers don't have to invest in what will be an eventual remedy. Um, and the last thing I want to say about this in my appeal to, I don't know who, is an important part of using Title VII in this way is we need to reframe trafficking as a racist act, as I said, but it's also an important time to strengthen labor laws and to strengthen race-based remedies. Because if there's two areas of law that are being chipped away at right now, it's labor protections and it's the idea that any law should speak specifically to race and redress on the basis of race. And so I think this is an innovative way to do both of those things. So, in the end, EEOC versus Global Horizons, these Thai workers have received upwards of $10 million in settlements and they're still getting yeah. yeah. Under Title VII. Only under Title VII. Yep. And. Um, then, did they get like visa? Like, or they, Almost all of them have T visas now. The EEOC was able to be a sponsoring agency. Okay. And once, it was interesting, once the settlement verdicts came in, their T visa started to be approved. Oh, so once people saw mm -hmm. that there was a real quantifiable mm -hmm. harm done to these folks, mm -hmm. then the T visas started to come. And so that's enough, you know, it speaks to the failure of trafficking remedies, but also a great result for some great workers. Thanks. Okay. What time? Right? <laughs> 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 Sorry, but approach there, and then like, we can have conversations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It, yes, time is off, so like my, I am like this charge for moderator duty, <laughs> so <laughs> of course, please ask questions. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, th um, thank you very much. That was really interesting, and I think, thank you for enlightening us with this, um, the possibility of using this legal regime in this setting. I think the question you have already kind of anticipated in your remarks, which is, the civil, the, the how big of a deterrent will the civil penalty be, mm -hmm. given that many of the industries in which you're going to go after who are willing to dodge, like the criminal, the potential mm -hmm. criminal violations, are also the same type of industries and employers who regularly dodge um, damages judgments or other mm -hmm. kind of monetary judgments leveled against them in other regimes, whether they're wage and hour or, or whatever. Um, and so, Given given that reality, um, do you believe that there will still be the deterrent effect in many of these industries? And then second, um, I thought you raised a very good point about the ability to, to then use this as a vehicle to bring the private bar into play. And we've seen both the diminution, unfortunately, in terms of private the private bar doing you know kind of like tried and true Title VII work, but also given fact that many lawyers will, might also make the same calculus that ultimately there won't be a recovery against them. Do you anticipate that as potentially being a, 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 a blockage to using Title VII in the private bar? And I understand yeah. the EOC would be a different context. Sure, it's, yeah. that's a great question and it gets into the sort of thorny issue of joint employer liability. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, you know, Title VII is one area in which the jurisprudence is okay on joint employer liability. There's a history of holding 
two employers responsible. So for in the case of Global Horizons, there's the labor recruiting company, Global Horizons, that all the Thai workers worked for, but then they're sent to work on these farms. And they're pay the farms pay Global Horizons $8 an hour per worker. Global Horizons pays the Thai workers $0 an hour per worker and treats them terribly. But what the EEOC was able to do was to use Title VII's joint employer jurisprudence to hold the farms responsible as well. Because, of course, Global Horizons headed out the country and is gone and declared bankruptcy, and we're never going to see a dime from them. And everybody sort of knew that going into it, and everyone who's a labor practitioner like gets it. These shell corporations disappear, declare bankruptcy, and they're out of there. But Del Monte Pineapple is not out of there. They're going to be around. And so the real hook is to be able to show that Del Monte Pineapple knew or should have known that these Thai workers were being held in terrible conditions and were being discriminated against. And then you can get the settlement from the big farms who don't want this negative publicity, who don't want to be seen as trafficking workers. And unfortunately, you know, you're really right that, that that's going to be a very limited way to get justice because there's many situations in which people are trafficked and there's no joint employer or responsible. There's just, you know, one family with three domestic workers, mm -hmm. and that's not enough for a Title VII claim, and that family will disappear mm -hmm. once there's a judgment or a suit. Mm -hmm. So it is limited, but there's, but in terms of, you know, the possibility for attacking sort of like large corporate farms and larger industries, I think it's there if we can keep showing that joint employer liability. It's great work. I love organic art for you. I do a lot of stuff. I, I work with United Asia in local level. Okay. One of my, Cynthia Ford is one of my ex students. Oh, okay. But um, I think this is a great approach, and I always get a little the anxiety that builds up is always because of these federal agencies, and you know, they may be driven by also the political leadership. Mm -hmm. And you know, this opens the door, I think, opportunities to either create regulations since we have potentially a chance with this president uh, knowing what may or may not come after him. That well, how much of this can we create some either internal EOC new regulations or some policies to make sure that regardless of which president succeeds President Obama, uh, that regardless of political leadership there'll be these mechanisms so we can move forward in this direction. Well, I mean, I think the joint employer issue is the yeah. one in my fantasy world. And also in my fantasy world, we expand Title VII protections, at least in a limited way, to uh, job sites where there's 15 workers or less. Because that's a huge hole in Title VII. Um, and, you know, I think also expanding the definition of workplace harassment and disparate treatment to encompass more of the exploitation we see now because Title VII was really built around jobs that didn't want to hire African Americans. That's not the problem now. Now employers are looking to hire people of color so that they can exploit them. Mm -hmm. So the issue isn't maybe keeping people out, it's bringing people in for the wrong reasons. And I think new regulations and rules could address that kind of predatory recruitment mm -hmm. in, a, in a better way. Okay, so that concludes our panel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your participation. <laughs> oh, also, I want to say one more thing since I'm on my soapbox. Mm -hmm. Facebook and all these crazy tech people expanding the H2A visa programs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I, I mean, that's the other thing, right? We can't tie H2A visas to a single employer because it's just it's a rescue for education. Thank you, Ken.